Welcome to our kitchen laboratory headquarters, where we're answering all the questions you've ever had about food with real science. We all know that eating too much ice cream or too many hamburgers can make you gain a few pounds. But there may be something else, a more sinister culprit working against you. Is it possible that your plates are making you fat? Why do I always find myself on the dirty side of science? Also, the effects of drinking alcohol are well documented. This is some serious drinking, but what about Whoa. eating it? Can food that is cooked with wine or baked with liquor actually get you drunk? And you might have heard of death by chocolate, but what's the deal with death by water? Is it really true that drinking too much H2O can kill you? Your heart doesn't beat, your lungs don't work. That could ruin your whole day. Plus, asparagus doesn't smell like much going in, but coming out is another story. We'll explore the science behind this stinky situation. So join me, Ted Allen, as we investigate these burning questions on Food Detectives. Most meals today are served on plates about this size or even larger. But 30 years ago, chances are you'd be served your dinner on a plate more like this size. Does this discrepancy in dinnerware cause you to eat more than you think? Are your dishes making you fat? I'm here with Dr. Brian Wansink, a food psychologist from Cornell University who's been studying people's eating habits for years. Brian, is it true that something as simple as plate size could influence how much we eat? Well, consider this. If you go to an antique store, you'll find that the dishes they made 30 or 40 years ago are significantly smaller than the dishes we have in our kitchen today. And as the size of dishes has gotten bigger, so have the size of people. And I think there's a connection. But over those years, wouldn't people notice that they're eating more? Well, it's a visual illusion. Take a look at this. I've got two black dots here. Which black dot is bigger? Well, Doc, I think I know where you're going with this, but <laughs> I will admit the dot on the right looks bigger to me. Well, everybody who would see this would say the same thing, but in reality, these two dots are exactly the same size. They're both an inch and a half. And what this tells us is that context can play a big role in tricking us into thinking something is either bigger or smaller than it actually is. I see that on this optical chart. But does this really translate to portion size and the amount of food people eat? Let's find out. To test this theory, we've set up the same meal in the same room at the same time for two different groups of people. The only difference will be the size of their plates. We'll start by weighing all of the food on the buffet, allowing us to track the depletion of each dish, serving by serving. And at the end, we'll weigh all of the leftover food to see how much each side of the room has consumed. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us here at the Astor Center for our Food Detectives Taste Test. Today, you'll be having a fantastic pasta lunch, so please feel free to come on up, grab a plate, have as much as you like. Thanks a lot. The subjects were told they are dining for free in exchange for telling food detectives which dish they liked best. Brian and I are watching the scales to see how much people are eating. Those who wanted seconds were encouraged to help themselves. This is an important part of our experiment. We are comparing the total amount of food that is consumed over the course of a meal. So, if the small plate club is more likely to partake in a second round, that will be figured into our calculations. Later on, we'll determine exactly how much food was consumed. And we'll reveal if using larger plates is enough to make you supersize your meal. Benjamin Franklin once said, a few stems of asparagus eaten shall give our urine a disagreeable odor. Which brings us to a rather delicate question from one of our viewers. Does eating asparagus really make urine smell a little funky? 
And how come not everyone experiences this problem? Asparagus is high in vitamins A, C, and K. It's also known for its medicinal, and some say aphrodisiac, qualities. But it's the sulfur compound called mercaptan that's at the crux of our question today. Mercaptan is found in rotting eggs and skunk secretions. It's so aromatic that it's added to natural gas to make leaks easier to detect. So how does mercaptan affect our output after we eat asparagus? Scientists studying this phenomenon have come up with two very different schools of thought. Theory number one suggests that not everyone experiences pungency after they eat asparagus. According to scientists, only some people are born with the gene that produces the enzyme that breaks down mercaptan. They theorize that when you eat asparagus, your body begins to process mercaptan, producing byproducts that are released into the body. It's those byproducts that give you that formidable fragrance. One study showed that about 79% of Americans have this gene. Theory number two is also genetically based, that everyone processes mercaptan into a noxious bouquet, but that only some people have the gene that allows them to smell it. So what does this mean? Well, the jury's still out on exactly how these stinky stems interact with our bodies. But hey, the bathroom was never much of a destination for aromatherapy anyway. So eat what you like. And if you have to, hold your nose. Coming up, we'll have the results of our plate size experiment. Is it possible that your choice in China is making you a little chubby? And when you bake desserts with alcohol, does the buzz really burn off in the oven? Whoa, man, we're gonna burn our eyebrows off. And later, we'll find out if it's possible to overdose on plain old water. Your heart doesn't beat, your lungs don't work. I hate that. That's next on Food Detectives. It's not uncommon to have a drink with your dinner. But what about a drink in your dinner? When you cook with alcohol, does it really burn off? Or is that just a myth? I'm here at the French Culinary Institute in New York to get to the bottom of this burning question from a viewer. And I'm joined by FCI's VP of Culinary Arts, Chef Nils Noren. First of all, Nils, why is alcohol used in cooking? Obviously, the biggest reason is flavor. Alcohol is a fermented product, so it has a very rich flavor. Ah, but most people believe that when you cook with alcohol, it burns off. Yeah, most people think it goes instantly, like this. But that's not actually true. Some of the alcohol does burn off, but most of it stays in the dish. The amount of liquor left depends on three things. The amount of time it's cooked, the surface area of the pot or pan, and the temperature it's heated to. Chef Norin is going to cook several dishes so he can see how these factors impact the amount of booze that remains in your food. On the menu is squab in a port wine reduction, a savory bourbon cornbread, and for dessert, bananas flambe cooked with rum. Even by reducing the port wine into a sauce, we're still going to have some of the alcohol left. Because it's really the alcohol that's on the surface of the, the, the pot here that goes off. But all the alcohol that's in the bottom is not going to come off right away. We started with one full bottle of port, okay. and we have about 20% of that left. So, only a fifth of the bottle is left in the food. The rest of it was cooked off. Eating this dish would be equivalent to drinking approximately one glass of port. OK, well, I don't think this dish is going to get me in too much trouble. No, I won't, but the next dish will pack a little more of a punch. Really? Yes. Our next course is a savory cornbread baked with bourbon. So you started with about a cup. Yes, and this is what we have after. A cup of bourbon went into the bread before it was baked. Sure, 50% of that was cooked off, 
but eating half a cup of bourbon isn't any different from drinking it. So, why does the cornbread retain more alcohol than the port wine reduction? Much of the bourbon gets trapped under the cornbread's thick crust, so the alcohol molecules can't escape. That's why so much bourbon is left in the bread. All right, I can see how the cornbread might trap the alcohol because it has a crust on top. But here, you're about to flambe something, which means you're going to light it on fire. Don't tell me that's not gonna burn off the alcohol. I mean, you would think so, but you'd be surprised by the result. Okay. So what we're gonna do is the flambe bananas. So what we have done is we've cut the bananas. We have our pan getting nice and hot. Sure looks hot. So we're gonna put our bananas in there. Because we want to get a nice and brown color before we start flambeing them. OK. Oh, you can smell that cooking already. So here we have about a little more than half a cup of rum. Whoa! Man, we're going to burn our eyebrows off. Yeah, that's pretty, pretty massive heat. Even with all this burning, you're actually still going to have a lot of alcohol left there. How much alcohol do you think might still be in the pan? Uh, you know, some studies say that up to 75% of the alcohol is still left. So we started off with about half a cup of rum, and we have this much left even after you lit it on fire. That's correct. Three quarters of the rum that is poured into the pan makes it to your plate. That's a strong bite for something sweet. Just because it burns doesn't mean it burns off. This dish was heated to around 500 degrees for a very short time. So. We started out with the squab and the port wine sauce. We then had the cornbread with bourbon. We finished with our bananas and rum. Now that's the alcohol you are eating in your food. And it's not any different than if you were drinking it from a glass. You're probably gonna have a couple glasses of wine. And then let's say you might wrap it up with a cordial. This is some serious drinking. That's a big night. I call it breakfast. Yeah. And there you have it. When you're cooking with alcohol, you're not burning off all the booze. So remember, always eat responsibly. Mmm, so good. When Food Detectives returns, we'll find out if buying new plates is actually a good diet tip. We all know the dangers of not drinking enough water, but is it possible to go to the other extreme? We want to know, can drinking too much water kill you? Here to give us the undiluted truth, Mark Janot, Editor-in-Chief of Popular Science and the head of our research team at the magazine. Hey, Ted. Hey, Mark. So is it really possible to kill yourself with water? Well, it does seem surprising, but there have been many cases of people actually dying from too much water. But it's far more common at marathons, where runners have a natural tendency to want to put as much water as possible into their bodies. But our bodies are 65% water, so how is it possible to drink so much that it's harmful? There are a series of effects that can happen when you OD on water. The main problem is something called hyponatremia, which is when the electrolytes in your body are thrown off balance. I think most of us are familiar with the term electrolytes. We get them from sports drinks. What do electrolytes do for the body? Their main job is to help the cells maintain a voltage across the cell membrane. This is kind of weird to think about, but remember that our nerve impulses are electrical. And electrolytes carry those impulses. When you overdose on water, it throws off the balance of electrolytes. Our cells react to this imbalance by taking in too much water. They swell up and go into something called osmotic shock. As in the scientific principle of osmosis, in which a substance naturally wants to move from an area of greater concentration into an area of lesser concentration. Precisely. And it can be fatal. All right, Ted, I think you'll find this experiment to be even more illuminating. Fantastic.
Uh, I've got here a couple of beakers with distilled water in them. That means it's about as pure as we can get. Could you hand me that battery over there? Sure, but uh, don't we believe that electricity and water don't mix? Well, that is true uh, to a certain extent, as you'll soon see. I'm gonna set this up here so that we're dropping a wire into the water here and clipping it to the negative electrode here. And this wire is going to the LED light array over there. And finally, we'll attach this uh, clip to the positive electrode. All right, well, so far, Mark, I have to give your science fair project about a C minus because nothing's happening. Aha, just you wait. I'm gonna pour some salt in here. And we're gonna see if we can get a little closer to an A. To simulate fluid in the human body, salt is dissolved into the water. This forms electrolytes. Uh-huh. Wow, okay, all right, they're glowing. So the salt is making the water more conductive. Now, as you might guess, the electrolytes in your body are not just dissolved table salt. But like the salt, they contain free ions and work as an electrically conductive medium. And just as those ions from the salt make the water more conductive, electrolytes are necessary to conduct electricity in your body. Right, and if you dilute the fluid around your cells too much, there won't be a high enough concentration of ions to keep you charged. Electrolytes are an essential part of the process by which our nerve impulses are transmitted. Without electrolytes, those nerve impulses don't work properly. Without impulses, your heart doesn't beat, your lungs don't work. It's a real problem. That could ruin your whole day. All right, when it comes to overdosing on water, how much is too much? It's not really a question of how much, Ted, but how fast. If you drink eight cups of uh, water over the course of 24 hours, that's fine. But if you do it over 24 minutes, you really run the risk of throwing your electrolytes out of balance. And if you are a heavy exerciser or have some sort of health problem, that could make it even worse. Thanks, Mark. Now, we're not suggesting that you give up on H2O anytime soon. As a matter of fact, you're much more likely to suffer from dehydration than you are from a water overdose. Here's the key. Keep that water intake to a steady flow, not a flood. Up next, we'll reveal if reducing the size of your plates can trim the size of your waist when Food Detectives returns. Now it's time to find out if plate size really does influence how much we eat. We're here at the Astor Center. Earlier, two groups helped themselves to identical buffets. The only difference is that one side of the room used small plates, and the other side was given big ones. We carefully weighed all of the food before they dug in so that we'd be able to calculate exactly how many calories each group consumed. Well, Brian. Ready to take some measurements? Not just yet, we need to look at the leftovers and factor those into our calculations. We have to bust the tables. Yeah. I'll take the little plates. Okay. Okay, let's get to it. Finding out if the big plates caused people to serve themselves more food isn't enough. We want to find out if they actually ate more. Why do I always find myself on the dirty side of science? That's why we're subtracting the leftover scraps from the amount of food taken from the buffet. Not all that much waste on the small plate side. Most of them were members of the Clean Plate Club. The difference will tell us how much supper our subjects really swallowed. Not surprisingly, there isn't much left on the plates on either side of the room. That's because people generally eat about 90% of what they serve themselves. <laughs> 